All right, here we go. Vlad TV would like to welcome Michael Franzis, uh, the only high-ranking official of a major crime family to actually walk away without protective custody, without witness protection, and actually survive. Is that an accurate, you know, description? I would think so. To walk away publicly, as I have done over the past several years, yes. So, your background is actually in the Colombo uh, crime family. Correct. So let's go ahead and start in the beginning. When did the Colombo crime family actually launch and start? Well, um, prior to it being the Colombo family, it was the Profaci family. And Joe Profaci was the original boss of that family. And um, it all occurred when Lucky Luciano broke up everything into you know, several different families, formed the commission, so on and so forth. So we're looking back to the uh, you know, 40s around there when it really came into existence. Okay, and there are five major crime families. Five major families in New York. There are actually nine throughout the country. Oh, okay. So five in New York, nine nationwide. Correct. And the Colombo was like the youngest in New York? Uh, you know, it could be. Colombo and Bonanno families were kind of the, uh, the smaller of the families, I would say. My boss at the time used to like to say, uh, we like quality, not quantity, in the amount of guys that uh, we bring into the family. So. Okay. So, so Joseph Colombo, uh, I guess he served from like 63 to 71. Correct. Okay, and then the family was named after him at that point? Yes. During this time, how big was the Colombo crime family? Like how many members? Uh, we had uh, about 115 made members at the time, men that actually took the oath. And we had a lot of associates, obviously, guys that were around the life but didn't actually take the oath. They weren't made members, and they're known as associates. We had hundreds of them at the time. Okay. Were the associates considered soldiers or, or no? No. Um, associates. When you come into the life and you take the oath, you come in as the position of a soldier. Um, that's when you're, you're a made man at that point. Got it. Okay, and I guess during that time there was a bunch of major wars that were happening in the Colombo family. Yeah, back at that time, uh, just prior to Joe Colombo becoming boss, we had the gallo Profaci War when the Gallo brothers, who were part of the family, uh, kind of revolted and uh, there was a war going on at that time. Colombo family, we've had our share of wars, you know, during our existence. So that was, uh, I mean, I was alive through that one, so it's one that I remember. Okay, and what year was that around? It was in the 50s. 50s into the 60s, yeah. Okay, so we get into the 60s, um, Colombo takes over, and there's another war at that point? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, they called it the Gallo the Colombo War also, but it was kind of like a, a spillover uh, because I think uh, at the time the Gallos felt that they should be in control of the family, and so there was an internal war at that time over that, and it was eventually resolved. Okay, and during these wars, basically guys are getting killed on both sides? Yes. Okay. How bad were these murders getting at one point? Like how many people were getting killed on a monthly basis? Well, again, this was before my time actually as being involved in the mm -hmm. life, but my dad was a prominent figure at the time. Right. And, um, you know, quite a few went down during the gallo Profaci War or gallo Colombo War. Um, I don't know the exact number at the time, but I do remember some incidents with my dad since he was very active during that time. And I know that we hadn't seen him for a while. He was away because, you know, he was, uh, you know, kind of undercover at that time. And um, quite a few guys were killed, I remember. Um, yeah, it was a tough war. Okay. So your grandfather was an associate, but not actually a made man. That's correct, yes. But then your father became a made man. Yes. And how did he end up joining that whole uh, the whole family. You know, my father grew up in Brooklyn, and he was uh, he was a tough kid, good kid, and uh, he just caught the eye of, you know, some of the older guys, some of the guys that were made at the time, and he started to hang with them. And you know, the way he tells me, my grandfather actually didn't want him to become part of the life, even though my grandfather was very well respected in our neighborhood in Greenpoint, but he never wanted to be involved, although he could have. He liked being, you know, on the outside and kind of cautioned my father to get involved because he said, you know, once you do, your life is really not your own. But my dad had it in him, and, uh, you know, he ended up getting uh, involved in the 30s, actually. He was young when he got inducted. Okay, and he actually moved his way up to an underboss. Correct, yes. Okay, so describe the structure, because at the top you have the boss. Right. And then you have the underboss. And then the capo? Yeah, it's you have a boss, an underboss, a capo regime, or captain, and a soldier. 
Okay. And uh, those are the four positions. There is a position called consigliere, and he's kind of appointed by the boss as his advisor. Actually, the position really is uh, he is a liaison between the men and the boss. Mm -hmm. Like if you have a gripe, you know, about something that's going on in the family, you go to the consigliere, you're supposed to straighten it out with the boss. The only problem with that is that if you have a gripe with the boss and you go to the consigliere and he brings it to the boss, you're probably going to get killed. So you never gripe about the boss. It's not okay. smart in that life. Okay, so your dad actually moved up from a soldier to a capo yes. to an underboss. Correct. Is there a reason why he never became a boss? He went to prison. Mm. Yeah, if, uh, I believe until today that if my father were on the street uh, and didn't get into the, the problems that he had, he would have been the boss at one point. So here you are growing up in this family, and your dad is a high-ranking member of the Colombo family. Right. And you have siblings. You have a brother and a sister? Yeah, I was one of seven, actually. One of seven? Yeah. I okay. had two brothers and, uh, and all those sisters. Okay. All, all the same parents? Um, actually, my father was married once before, so okay. we had, he had three children from his first marriage. Okay, then four, four children yes. with, with your mother. Okay. So you have, a, you have this family, and you're growing up, and then, you know... As a kid, you don't really know anything different, but you're starting to get older, and you're seeing that your dad is a little different than the other dads. There's more police presence, and there's more secrecy, and so forth. So at what point did you start to realize what's going on? Well, it was early on, because my dad was one of the highest profile figures of his day. You know, he was kind of like the John Gotti of his day, if you can <laughs> make that comparison. But uh, law enforcement tactics against organized crime were different back then than they are today. You know, today is everything is very covert, undercover informants, high-tech surveillance equipment. Back then, when you were under investigation, they wanted you to know about it. And my dad was under investigation maybe for a period of about 10 years, growing yeah. up in Brooklyn, later on Long Island, from seven or eight different agencies. And they would all have a big presence in our lives. They'd have their cars parked around our house 24-7. So whenever we would go anywhere as a family, we had a parade of law enforcement vehicles following us. So. You know, I, I, I had a lot of scuffles with them early on, and their presence was there. So I grew up really hating the police. I hated the government, hated law enforcement. So you would argue with the undercover cops, like in front of your house and so forth? Yeah, I mean, I'd lead them on a wild goose chase <laughs> if they thought my dad was with me, you know. And they, they did some things to get even with me. And, you know, so I always had scuffles with them along the way. I mean, how is your dad doing his business if there's literally someone following him as soon as he comes home? I mean, as soon as he leaves the house to the point where he comes home again? Well, he had to be very careful, you know, if he had a meeting that he didn't want them involved in, he had to have an escape route, you know. One of the ways we do it, I mean, we had uh, uh, homes in Brooklyn, you know, we had a big family. My dad was one of 19, so we had relatives everywhere in Brooklyn. So he'd go in the door of one house, go through the backyard, you know, into the other house, go out the front door of the other's way. I had somebody waiting, and the cops were still waiting for them at the other house. So, you, you, you know, when we were under surveillance, we had to devise different ways to try to shake the, uh, the tail that we had. Okay. So you had a high school graduation party. Yeah. And something interesting happened with that whole situation. Yeah. Well, it was in our backyard. My dad put up a, a big tent and we had entertainment. We had probably 500 people there. And all of my friends, uh, they drove their cars, obviously, or they borrowed somebody's car to come to the, uh, to the event. And uh, the police were around, uh, detectives, Nassau County, I should say, and they took the license plate number of every car in the neighborhood, every single car. So several weeks later, you know, friends of mine are starting to get uh, subpoenas to go to the grand jury. And uh, it was all about them attending, uh, you know, my graduation party. And if they drove somebody else's car and that person wasn't even at the event, they got the subpoena because that's, that's where they got the name from, that license plate number. So that was... Uh, okay. I mean, in high school, was there a level of, hey, that's, that's Michael, that's the son of so-and-so, you don't really want to mess with them? you know, that type of thing, or were you just a regular high school kid? You know, I mean, look, you guys knew who my father was, and it was a thrill to some of them, you know, to be around me, and to others, they didn't care. But, you know, when I was younger, I had some issues of it, because my dad had publicity, and they, oh, you got a mafia father, and, you know, mm. I fight, you know, so it was that kind of a thing early on. But uh, it didn't hurt me too much, you know, in that regard. Uh, so... During this whole time, your dad was not involving you in any of this. He wasn't mentioning it at home, nothing. No, my dad wanted me to go to school and be a doctor. Okay. You know, I was an athlete in school. He was uh, very supportive of me as, a, as an athlete, attended all my games, and he wanted me to be legitimate. Okay. So you graduated high school, you go to college, 
and then your dad gets busted. Yeah, in the early 60s, my dad was uh, uh, indicted several times, three times in the state of New York. Very serious crimes, grand larceny, homicide. Uh, homicide was in Queens, actually. And he went to trial on all three of those cases over a period of a couple of years. He was acquitted, found not guilty. But then in 66, the feds indicted him uh, for masterminding a nationwide string of bank robberies. Hmm. He was convicted in 67 and sentenced to 50 years in prison. 1970, after he lost his appeals, he gets shipped off to Leavenworth Penitentiary to do his time to begin his sentence. And I was a pre-med student, Hofstra University at that point. I was going to be a doctor. And I was devastated when Dad went in. I mean, he was 50 when he went in. I figured he had 50 on top of that. He'd never come out of prison alive. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was devastating. Okay. And at that point, you started thinking about the whole mafia thing. Well, what really happened, no, I, I can't say that. Uh, Joe Colombo had started the Italian-American Civil Rights League. What happened, his son, Joe Jr., had gotten indicted by the feds on some case for uh, melting down coins for their silver value or something crazy <laughs> like that. So Joey called us all up, you know, and he said, hey, my son is being framed. We're not going to have this happen anymore to any of us. He, uh, he said, we want to go down to the... Uh, uh, the FBI building on 69th Street and 3rd Avenue in Manhattan. We're going to picket the FBI. So for me, hey, great. They framed my father. This is a chance for me to maybe help my dad out. So I was one of the first uh, to, to be on that picket line. And I was a kid. I was 18, 19 years old. And that's how I started to get involved with people on that line. Well, I guess Joe Colombo got shot right next to you or... Yeah, he, uh, well, the, that Italian-American Civil Rights League grew into several hundred thousand members. I mean, Joey had a lot of influence there, and it became a big deal. You know, the feds hated it. Uh, Joey started to have some problems because, according to guys on the street, he was bringing too much attention to that life and so on and so forth. So we had a big rally, 1971, in Columbus Circle in Manhattan. Huge. There's probably 50,000 people there. And uh, we had a big stage set up because entertainment, I mean, I think Sammy Davis was there, Sinatra was going to appear, we had top-notch entertainment, and he was going to talk about what the league was all about. And I, I'll never forget, it was a beautiful day, and um, I had just walked up on the stage, and Joey had handed me some brochures to hand out, you know, up by uh, a couple blocks up on 60th Street. And I took them, because I was a captain in the league, not in the family at that point, mm -hmm. in the league. I had a button. And uh, I walked away, I was about 10 steps away, and all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. I heard shots run out, and somebody screamed, Joey was hit, Joey's been hit. He went down, and there was mass hysteria at that point. So the boss of the family just got shot. Yes. Right next to you. Um, was he killed at that point, or no? No, he lingered uh, for about six or seven years, and then he eventually died. But he was, he was in a coma the whole time. Oh, okay, so pretty much that pretty was, much the, did, that was yeah. the end of his... Correct. His yes. reign at that point. Was that the first time you saw mafia violence? Uh, yes. That was my first experience like that, of that seriousness, that gravity, yes. Okay. But you ended up joining the mafia after that. Yes. There wasn't a level of, okay, this is, this is real. This is not the movies. This is what's really happening. Here's the head guy in my father's organization. He essentially was almost, you know, essentially killed... Yeah. And put in a coma after the situation, maybe I'll stick to school instead. Well, you know, I had such a, uh, uh, a, a goal, a driving force in me to help my dad get out of prison. I believe my dad was framed because I asked him, I said, Dad, what's with these bank robbery charges? And he looked at me and he says, son, I'm innocent. And what I, why I really believed him is because the four bank robbers that testified against him were all drug addicts. They're all junkies. And from the time I was a kid, my dad preached to, uh, to me against drugs. He hated anything to do with drugs. So I said, why would he get involved with drug addicts? So I believed that he was innocent. He was framed. And I figured if I didn't help him out, he was going to die in prison. So I told him I lost interest in school. We were in the visiting room, Leavenworth Penitentiary. I said, Dad, I'm not going to school. If I don't help you out, you're going to die in here. And he, we kind of went at it a little bit. Now oh, your mother's going to be upset. You're leaving school. I said, Dad, it's too late. My mind's made up. And he said, okay, but if you're going to be on the street, I want you on the street the right way. And uh, his mind, the right way is to become a member of his life. So he proposed me for membership at that point in time. Because, you know, you become a member of that life. You can't just go up to somebody and say, hey, I'd like to join. Somebody's got to propose you, vouch for you, say you have what it takes. So in my case, it was my dad. He sent word downtown. 
He said, my son, I'm proposing him for membership, and that's how it started. Okay, so you became a recruit at that point. Correct. This was what year? This was in uh, 70, around 72. Okay. And a year and a half later, you became a made man. Correct. During that time, were they just sending you out on missions and so forth? You know, I mean, the way they ran it down to me, the boss at that time, he's now passed on, Tom DeBella. He said, Mike, I got a message from your father. He said, you want to become a member of our life? Is that true? I said, yes. Here's the deal. From now on, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're on call to serve this family, the Colombo family. That means if your mother is sick and dying and you're at her bedside, we call you to service. You leave your mother mm. and you come and serve us. From now on, we're number one in your life. Uh, before anything and everything. And when if we feel you deserve this privilege, you're in the honor to become a member, we'll let you know. So basically, uh, I'm on call 24-7 to do whatever I was told to do. Okay. What were the worst things you had to do during that time? Look, you know, I always say this. It's a tough question to answer, but uh, I like to be as honest as I can be. You know, a lot of menial things, you know, drive the boss to a meeting, sit in a car for five hours, you know, <laughs> that until he comes out. Uh, you had a meeting at 8 o'clock, you weren't there at 7.30, you were late. You can never be late in that life, never. Stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, look, I'll be honest, you know, that life at times is very violent. And if you're part of the life, you're part of the violence, and there's no escape. If you're told to do something, you do it or you pay the price. So to yes. say I wasn't part of that would not be truthful. I mean, how did you take to the violence yourself at that point? Because you were, what, a teenager at that point or 20? No, 20? I was, I was uh, when I got straightened out, I was 24. So I, you know, but I was recruited 22. Okay, so you're in your early 20s, yeah. And now, you're you're, you know, essentially being forced to do these violent acts, or else, right? Well, look, I had a choice. I could have said no and walked away at yeah. that time and, and just gave it all up, but I didn't. So I don't like to see anybody push me into it. I mean, I made a conscious choice to do this, and um, you know, I'll be honest with you, look. Um, I can't say I was comfortable with everything that I had to do during that time, um, but I did it. You know, I didn't want to, uh, uh, I didn't want to displease my dad, and uh, I didn't want anybody to think I didn't have what it takes to do what I had to do. So, you know, when you have to do things that are unpleasant, at least in my experience, you kind of step outside of yourself if you're capable of doing that. Do what you have to do, and then, you know, you move on. Okay. So then a year and a half later, you were actually made. Correct. And there was a ceremony where they burn something in your hand, I believe. Yeah, it was a uh, picture of a saint, Catholic Golden Card. They prick your fingers, some blood drops on the floor, and they burn a saint in your hands, and, and you take an oath. Okay. And you actually came in with another group of guys. Yeah. It was uh, in the early 70s or the mid-70s, they had the expression that they opened the books, meaning that they were starting to bring in a lot of guys. Prior to that, for about 20 years, they weren't making any new guys. The only way they would make a guy in a family is if they had to replace a guy that died. But then in the mid-70s, they opened the books up and they were taking guys. The families were building up. Okay. So you were part of that buildup? Yes. Now, out of the, the guys that joined in with you, only one of them is still alive? Um, that's correct, yeah. Okay. And there were, what, five or six guys? Well, the guys, the night that I took the oath, there were six of us. I'm the only one alive out of them. Okay. I'm the only one alive out of that group. But there are some guys that took the oath during that period of time that are still alive. So now you're a made man in the mafia. Yes. How did that feel? You know, it felt good. I mean, you know, this is what I aspired to be at that point in time. And I, uh, I kind of did, you know, I paid my dues to get into that life. So... You know, when I got in, I, I wanted to be the best possible mob guy I could be, I'll be honest. I was motivated to do two things. I wanted to get my dad out of prison, and I was uh, helpful in that. We did get him out on parole uh, after serving uh, almost 10 years. And I wanted to make money. My dad said, you know, in that life you make money, it translates to power, not unlike the real world. So I was fortunate. I had a head for business, and I knew how to use that life to benefit me in business. I was very aggressive. I brought some new things into the family that hadn't been done before. So um, I was uh, successful at, uh, uh, in that regard. Okay, so you come in now, you're a made man, you're a soldier at this yes. point. So you don't have a crew. Well, I had a crew of associates. Associates. Yeah, I didn't have a crew of, of made okay. guys. Right. So you had, you had a crew of associates. How many guys in the beginning? Oh, gosh, uh, probably 20. Okay, a nice, yeah. nice group of people. Good size, yeah. Good size group of people. And you guys start doing crimes. Correct. Okay. So what were some of the early money-making schemes in the beginning? 
You know, everybody that's involved in that life, uh, you start Shylocking, putting money out on the street on usurious, you know, for usurious uh, interest rate. Uh, so okay. I did that. So, so let's talk about that for a second. So a regular guy has a gambling problem and he gambled off his, his rent that month. He needs a couple thousand dollars. He can't go to the bank because he's already maxed out on everything. He goes right. to you, says, I need $2,000 right now. Correct. You give it to him. At what interest rate? Depends. You know, it depends on who it is and what the circumstances were. You know, for me, it was anywhere from 1% a week up to 5% a week. That's what I would charge. 20% a month. Yeah. So th that means that if you gave him $1,000, he owed you $1,200 at the end of the month. Correct. Okay. Yeah. What happens if he doesn't pay? Well, you know what? For the most part, people pay. And, you know, sometimes you make a deal. But look. You know, people that are out to beat you uh, and you find that out. For instance, we lend money to a gambler. You know, he says, I promise I'm not going to gamble anymore. And he's going to pay. And then we find out he's gambling everywhere else around town and he can't pay you. Well, he may pay a significant price for that. Yeah. Put a guy in a hospital, hurt him. Yeah, it happens. Okay. So you and your associates are out there putting money on the street and making that yeah. money back. In my case, most of the time, I would give the money to my associates and they would put it out to somebody else. So I held okay. my associate responsible, really. Okay. Is a lot of money made through Shylocking when you were doing it at that point? Or is it just, okay, it's enough to get by, but this is not really what my aspiration is? Well, I'll tell you, when I was, uh, when I was rolling pretty high and I had income from a lot of different areas, I had almost a million dollars on the street. A million dollars yeah. in loans? Yeah out to various people, whether they be in business, whether they were my own guys, and I was collecting, you know, two points, maybe five points a week. It all depended. I probably average about 3% a week hmm. on the million. So it was a lot of money. Okay. So a million dollars, that's 30000 a week yeah. in just interest. Okay. Pretty good. It's good money. Okay. What were some of the biggest things that you were loaning money on? You know, a lot of times in business, guy owned a, a, you know, a club. I got involved with a number of clubs. They always need money, you know. And uh, so, you, you know, you, you fairly, you got a good shot of getting your money back because they have cash flow. You know, okay. we're in the club, we're watching, we see what's going on. We got the register there, we got the guy. So I tried to, you know, make my loans to people that I knew had the capacity to pay, obviously. You don't want to give it to anybody. So people in business, normally you had a shot. Okay. And, you know, you see movies like, for example, Goodfellas where you see these type of scenarios play out where the person can't pay and now the mafia guy is a partner in the business. Was that happening? Yes. Yeah, okay. it's, it was a way to get involved in a business. Like, there were times when, okay, I don't want my money back, but I'm your partner. You know, it's one of those things. I mean, it's, it's a way we used to get in the door, yes. Okay. And actually, your name was in Goodfellas. Yes. Well, there was a guy, I mean, I don't know if there's any really speaking roles outside of him saying hello, but there was like this scene where it shows all the various guys in the mafia, and there goes Michael. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Goodfellas thing, it, it, it was a different family, obviously, but I was a pretty well-known guy. I knew Henry Hill really well, and I knew Paulie Vario. I knew Jimmy Burke. So I think I had some name value at the time, so they threw me into the movie for that purpose, you know. But I really, business-wise, I didn't have much to do with those guys. Okay. You're, you're Shylocking, and you're making money that way, but then you start getting into other businesses. Yeah. So what comes next? You know, I had a legitimate business. I had uh, two automobile dealerships that I had put together. I had a leasing company. I had a couple of things going on in a legitimate sense. But the biggest scheme that I ever fell upon, I would say, or helped create, was I devised a scheme to defraud the government out of tax on every gallon of gasoline. And I ran that operation for seven years. Um, I brought in the Russian mob guys uh, from Brighton Beach, Brooklyn because they had an independent station at the time, branded an independent group of gas stations at the time. And um, we did quite well. I had, at one point in time, I had over 350 gas stations that I either owned, operated, or was delivering product to. I had 18 companies um, that were licensed to collect the tax on every gallon of gasoline. I had connection to get the licenses at the time. And at one point in time, I was selling a half a billion gallons of gas a month, and we were taking down 30 to 40 cents a gallon. So if you do the math, it was a significant amount of money. There was times we were pulling in $10 million a week. 
So um, I ran that operation for seven or eight years. As a result of that, I became pretty well known because everybody wanted to get involved in the business, from not only from my own family, but from other families. So as a result, I made some very good relationships with uh, some prominent guys in some of the other families. And, uh, you know, I was riding high. 1980, they made me a captain. My former boss, who just passed away a couple of weeks ago, appointed me as a captain because I was bringing in a lot of money for the family. So. Okay, so you're basically charging a tax that didn't exist on gasoline? No, we were collecting the tax rather than paying the government. We oh. Were keeping it. Oh, so you were collecting on behalf of the government and just keeping it and for yourself. And we were just keeping it. We weren't paying it. Okay. And you were bringing in sometimes 30 or 40 million a week? Yeah, well, the, collect, the, the tax on a gallon of gasoline back then uh, was 25 to 30 cents city, state, local, depending upon mm-hmm. where you were located. And it was 9 cents federal. So you had about 40 cents a gallon. So we were essentially selling the gas, collecting the tax, not paying the government. And we had a scheme devised to, uh, uh, to hold the government off. And normally on any license that we had, we had about 10 months before the government would come down on that company and say, okay, where's our money? We held them off for 10 months. But every day, the register's ringing because we're selling gas, we're collecting tax money. And then when, we, uh, when they finally come down on us, we'd just close the office and we'd move on to the next company with a new license. It was kind of a daisy chain. And they, they couldn't figure out what we were doing. Almost like a Ponzi scheme, in a way. In a way, but, but the, uh, the only victim was the government. Okay. So now you're pulling in tens of millions of dollars. Yes. Now you're a capo. Yes. How many soldiers underneath you? I had uh, about 15. 15 soldiers? Yes. And then each of those soldiers had a couple Number dozen of associates. associates. Yes. So you're overlooking hundreds of people now. Yes. But the money you're bringing in is split. It's not just 30 or 40 million in your own pocket. Correct. You have to kick up to the underboss, kick up to the boss. Yes. And also distribute money to, to your team. Yeah, well, we were all making money. I mean, look, you know, one, this scheme was mine. I mean, I created it, so I brought it to the family. And as a result, I, I would give them 25% of whatever I earned at that point. So they were making pretty good money. And then, of course, we're taking care of everybody that's working for you. So, but don't get me wrong, there was plenty of money to go around. So um, everybody was doing, we, we were known as a, a very wealthy crew, no doubt. Okay. And you yourself were starting to buy things for yourself as well. I yeah. guess you had your own plane? I had a jet plane. I okay. had a helicopter. I had, uh, you know, I built myself uh, an 8,000 square foot house with a racquetball court and a and, uh, you know, on two acres of land in Long Island. So I had a house in Florida. I had a house, another house in uh, Marina del Rey, California. So, I mean, you know, I was, I was accumulating wealth, but along, accumulating assets, but along the way, um, I had legitimate business also. I had a very successful uh, Mazda dealership. I had a successful uh, Chevrolet dealership on Long Island. Um, I had a, a motion picture company, a distributing company I had bought into. I was making movies, I was distributing them. So I had a good income uh, legally also. So I was able to cover a lot of stuff. Okay, so that's basically how you're laundering the money through the legitimate yeah. businesses. I mean, look, we used tax money to make a movie at one point in time. So, you know, <laughs> two and a half million dollar film, I, you know, I was a week's pay. <laughs> so, you know, it was pretty good. So at this point, the money is coming in like crazy. Yes. Was there ever a, a notion of, okay, I have enough money to retire with right now. I could walk away from all this, maybe go to a country that doesn't have U.S. Uh, extradition with my family, and just ride off into the sunset. Never thought of ever leaving America. Uh, no, not in any way, shape, or form. And, you know, it was my attitude at the time. You know, you, uh, I knew I was going to go down at one point in time. I mean, we, we all knew that. So you knew that the whole time? Yeah, I knew it was going to happen. I mean, even though you got to understand, I became a major target of law enforcement. I went to trial five times, so they were really on me. But here was my attitude. You get just as much time for stealing a million dollars as you do for stealing a billion. What's the difference? So I may as well keep going because if I give this up, somebody else is going to get it anyway. I'm already in a mess, so I may as well. And that's kind of the attitude I had. I did my best to try to cover myself in many, many ways, but you know what, what eventually got me was informants. People had flipped. Mm-hmm. During that time, how violent was the operation? Violent? Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't have to do 
many violent things. I mean, you know, they considered us to be the Robin Hoods in the gas business because we, we lowered the price at the pump because we weren't paying the taxes. So we were selling gas cheaper than anybody else because we were keeping the tax money. <laughs> so people on the street weren't really mad at us because whatever we were stealing in taxes, we were making up in their gas tanks, so they didn't care. Um, we didn't have to twist anybody's arm in a station to buy our gas. They wanted our gas because we were selling it cheaper. You know, I had a, uh, a big terminal I bought from British Petroleum, BP, in Oceanside. We had, we, I think it was about a three million gallon capacity. And I know at the one time the feds went to all the major oil companies and they said, you know, these guys are undercutting your business. Um, but really we weren't because we were buying barges of gasoline as they were coming over from the Middle East from the major oil companies. So we were buying more gas than anybody else was buying gas. So they didn't care, but they made believe that they did. You know, they sold me a terminal. I mean, we used to, we used to have a good time with these guys. So it, it was, I don't think you'll ever see another scheme like that. I'll be honest with you. Well, I mean, during the time on the street, you ran into Donnie Brasco. Yes. Okay, but you never had any illegal dealings with him. No, I knew uh, I knew Lefty Ruggiero pretty well. I knew Sonny Black and Sonny Red, but I never dealt with uh, him on the street. Thank God for that. I know <laughs> okay. him now, but I didn't know him then. Okay, you know him now. Yeah. Okay. I like him actually. He's a good guy. Um, so you, no one had any idea he was undercover. Not at that time. No. Not at that time. When you found out that he was. We were kind of shocked. I mean, you know, he was around uh, guys for a long time. You know, it was, it was kind of because he first started with the Colombo guys, with our family, and then he moved over to, uh, you know, to Lefty and that crew. Aha! So he was actually working with the Colombos at yeah. one point. Did he get any any guys busted in the Colombo uh, family? I, I don't think so. No, I think uh, what happened was he, for some reason, he connected with Lefty, and that relationship kind of prospered for him. So that's where he stayed. Hmm. When you saw the movie, was it fairly accurate from what you knew? In many ways, yeah. Okay. In some ways, no. But. Well, you also dealt with uh, John Gotti. Yes. The, the Teflon Don. Yes. You had some problems with him at certain points. Sit downs, yeah, over business. You know, I, you know, I, I like John. I mean, we got along. He was difficult to do business with. You know, I gotta be honest. But on a social level, great. You know, I had a lot of fun. We'd go out to a club. You know, he was he was a lot of fun to be around. And I, you know, I respected John a lot. I mean, he was. Uh, you know, he, he was a guy that commanded respect. He was different in a way, but, um, you know, I like him. I like his family. You know, I'm, I'm friendly with them, so. Okay. When he got locked up, because he was known as a Teflon Don because he kept beating his cases over and over again. Yeah. When he got locked up, did that change the culture of the mafia? No, not at all, because, you know, John was so out there. I mean, look, when you're that high profile, it's only a matter of time, you know. And I say, look, I had a respect for John because he didn't make no bones about who he was. You know, he says, I'm a gangster. This is who I want to be. This is who I am. And that's it, accept it or not. So, you know, there was no shame in his game in regard to that. But, you know, honestly, being that high profile is not helpful. You know, I mean, it, it just causes more heat. Um, but he was into it. What was he going to do? This is the way he lived his life, you know. So I don't blame him for anything other than, oh, he was so high profile, he brought heat. Everybody brings heat, you know? You can't blame them for that. Um, well, at one point you got into the booking business. Booking meaning? Uh, sports booking, I guess, oh, yeah, and yeah. concert booking and so yeah. forth? Okay, how did you get into that? Well, um, I was close to an agent who was an agent to the stars. He used to um, uh, book all the top black acts at the time in the business, music acts. You know, he had, he had a bunch of them, and Marvin Gaye and Dion Warwick and all of that. And he was very close to my dad. I knew him my whole life. So I got involved with him in, in some ways. And then, um, you know, because when my dad went away, he, was, he answered to me in many ways. So I was kind of partners with him in that booking business. And then one day he came and said, hey, I want to start representing athletes, you know, in their careers. And I got involved with him in that business, you know, him and a guy by the name of Lloyd Bloom. So, uh, you know, but I was on the periphery. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't actually in management. But I'll be honest with you, too. I looked at it as a way to get around some of these athletes because I had a fairly big gambling operation on the street. I had bookmakers that worked for me. Mm. And, you know, we had athletes gambling with us at the time. And, you know, you get an athlete to compromise the outcome of a game, you make some money. So that was happening. So these professional athletes were actually doing illegal gambling with your operation, they would get into trouble, yes. gamble more than they had, and then you'd get them to actually throw a game or alter a game a little bit. Yeah, 
you get them to shave points. You know, it's uh, remember, it's never about winning or losing. It's all about the point spread. You know, you mm. cover, you don't cover. So, um, and these guys used to get themselves in trouble. You know, and and uh, when they did, they were gambling with the bookmakers. They're not supposed to gamble outright, right, in front mm. of anybody. And they'd owe some money, and uh, you know, then they'd come to us, and we say, you got one or two choices. You either pay us now. And if you can't pay us, you pay us next week. And if you can't pay us next week, then we'll tell you how you're going to pay us back. And, you know, you got them to, to get into a, a position where they wouldn't, they either wouldn't play their position right to help us, you know, in, in the outcome of the game uh, or, or other ways. What were some of the teams that were compromised during this time? Well, look, I, you know, I don't like to get into that, but it, <laughs> let me tell you, it's across the board. Okay. Trust me. You know, Basketball, time, football, baseball. That, look, Basketball is one of the easiest games to, to get somebody to go along with because, you know, um, a basketball player, a good player, can pretty well control the outcome of the point spread. Mm -hmm. A referee can control the outcome of the point spread. Mm. And you may not win it in one game, but if you have somebody working with you over a period of time, most of the time you're going to come out ahead. Right. And I guess these days that doesn't really work because the salaries are so high. In the pros, yeah. yeah, they, you know, they still gamble. Don't get me wrong, but they can pay off their debt. Right now, it's college. Oh, it's college now. College, yeah. Okay, were you doing college back then also? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, we had college athletes gambling with us, and they get themselves in trouble, and you know, it's what happens. You were actually involved with Al Sharpton and Don King. Yes. During this time, can you talk about that? Yeah, I had a big undercover operation on me at the time. Obviously, I didn't know it. Where um, uh, an FBI agent undercover and uh, an informant that used to work with Muhammad Ali, they were trying to target the boxing industry for illegal gain. And so they got to me somehow through somebody I knew, and they were trying to get me to set up Don King, and they were trying to put us both in a problem and see how we were fixing fights and how you know, we were, were doing uh, things we shouldn't have been doing in the fighting game. And Al Sharpton, who I knew very well at the time, was my liaison between Don King and myself. And, um, you know, Don King, I mean, uh, um, Al Sharpton at the time, he was a gun for hire, you know. We would, uh, we needed him to do some things with his own people, which he called them at the time. We hired him to do it. We used to pay him, you know. He was, he was, uh, he was valuable in the music business because the Norby Walters, the guy I had at that time that was booking all these acts, we'd send Al out to, to meet with the act that he wanted to book, and Al would bring him to us for a price. That's hmm. how we used him. So uh, I know Al very well. Okay. And what happened with Don King? Well, they had an undercover operation on me for about eight or nine months. I eventually, but I was very leery of these guys. I was very careful how I, I worked with them. And I eventually brought them to Don King. But in the first meeting that I had with King, I said, look, I, I can only trace these guys back maybe a year. I said, so in this first meeting we have, don't say anything illegal. Play it straight. So everything across the board. They want to invest money. They'll invest it with you. We'll get into the fight game. But don't talk about anything you shouldn't be talking about. So we had the meeting, and he did it exactly like that. What happened was, and it was a big case. We called it shadow boxing. That was the, I mean, Sports Illustrated wrote it up. It was a whole big thing. Uh, what happened was they tried to continue. They were trying to get the money to give to Don. It was going to be a lot of money at the time. And they had, I believe, 81 tape recordings of me. They turned it over to the U.S. attorney at the time, and none of those tape recordings uh, uh, worked to have me indicted. I didn't say anything on them that would hurt myself. So they eventually had to close it down, and it went nowhere. But the only one that got in trouble over that was Al Sharpton, because he tried to do a drug deal with the, uh, the agents. And, uh, and then he became an informant after that, 100%, no matter what he says. He was an informant. He tried to do a drug deal. They got him on tape doing the deal, the whole bit. Al Sharpton? Al Sharpton. Was an informant? Absolutely, 100%. Okay. Did he get anyone busted? That I don't know. Uh, but, you know, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of news on this. I mean, Newsday wrote a three-part series on his being, you know, Al Sharpton and getting himself in trouble. I don't know how he skated that, but that's Al. I mean, he's a good talker. He gets away with stuff. 2002, you did a... A real sports uh, uh, appearance. Brian Gumble. With Brian Gumble. Yeah. And you talked about how you quote unquote persuaded Yankees players who owed you money to uh, affect the games. Well, I didn't actually do that. Um, they tried to get me to say that it was Yankees. Now, I'm a diehard Yankee fan. The last okay. team I'm going to hold accountable is the Yankees. But 
they tried to get me to say that it was Yankees. And all I said is, look, we had members of a lot of teams that were gambling with us, players, okay. and uh, I'm not singling out the Yankees. Okay, fair And enough. I'm not saying they threw any games. I'm not saying that. Okay. Not with my Yankees. Well, you were involved in the NBA at one point. Uh, in, with NBA players? Well, you had some sort of involvement in the NBA. Well, I was actually a, a speaker for them. I was speaking to uh, a lot of NBA rookies for a couple of years. Okay, about what? Dangers of gambling. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. They recruited me to actually at, talk to the As players. you were running an illegal gambling operation. No, this was after. This is after. This was after, okay. yeah. Well, you spoke on the Michael Jordan situation. Yeah. How, how involved were you, you know, in terms of your, well, I'm not going to say your involvement, but how much did you know about that whole situation? Because Jordan himself was a, a serious gambler. Yes. You actually referred to him as a degenerate gambler. He's a big gambler. Big. I mean, Michael gambles on everything from what my experience is, what I was told, and people that know him, yes. Okay. Did you personally know him at all or no? I met him. I met him uh, actually at a, a, an NBA deal that we had, an event. Yeah. Okay. But he never gambled with you? With me, no. Okay. So he had this serious gambling problem, and then his father gets murdered. And there was always speculation if one had something to do with the other. From what you know, again, I don't have firsthand knowledge of this, but being that I was working with the NBA at that time, um, I was told two things. One, that he was told to leave the NBA around the time that his father got murdered because stories were about to come out and there was a lot of heat on the fact that because of Michael's gambling habit, his father paid the price. And the NBA didn't want the, uh, uh, the press, so they asked him to leave for a while. That's when he went to play baseball. And then when things settled down, he came back. The plan was always, from what I was told, uh, for him to come back. Now, again, I heard this from a source I believe was, uh, was pretty knowledgeable, somebody I knew pretty well, inside the NBA. Um, so for me, it's secondhand information, but I thought it was reliable. And then putting it all together, knowing that, you know, Michael did have this uh, gambling issue, uh, that is very possible that that could have happened. So you're saying there's a, a strong possibility that his father was murdered because he wasn't paying back his gambling debts. I don't know. Again, I can't be specific. I don't know if it wasn't paying back. I don't know what, again, the specifics of it were. But I was led to believe that it had something to do with his gambling problem. Okay. Exactly what, I don't know. And honestly, I, I didn't care enough to look into it. Okay. But the guys who killed him got, got caught and sentenced. From what I heard, yeah. Yeah. By age 35, Fortune magazine did a, uh, I guess, a list of the top mafia earners of all time. And you were number 18 on that list. Yes. So how did it feel to, as someone that's supposed to be a legitimate businessman, to now have this article in this major magazine about you being one of the top earners in the mafia? Well, um, you know, people want to make the Forbes list, but I don't think in this way. No, you know, that was, uh, it came out in 86, and it was a huge job. It was the 50 biggest and wealthiest mob bosses in the country. Yeah. And they actually, it was a huge article. I mean, it was half the magazine. They actually featured six of us, and I was one of the six. And then they had the list. Featured as an interviewed? No, they featured six okay. people in that article. Got it. Six guys that were on the right. list. Yeah, and I was, was going to say, yeah. I was actually the youngest guy on the list. Yeah. Um, and I was five behind Gotti at the time. He was, he was 13. He hadn't been made boss yet. But um, uh, it hurt me bad because I was in prison at the time when the list came out, and they locked me down because of it, because Roy Rowan, the, uh, the author of the article, uh, reporter, he was talking a lot about me in the press and all the interviews that he was doing. So when you're, when you're in prison and you're getting all that media, they lock you down. They don't like you having that. So I never read the article until I got out. I didn't even know what it was. But... Uh, you know, I, I always say this, you know, I don't know how they make a list like that. They didn't ask for our tax returns, so I don't <laughs> right. know how that came about, but it was, it was kind of silly. But I'll tell you what's not silly about the list. They're all dead or in prison. Mm -hmm. I'm like the only one alive out in, in the street. They're all gone. Everybody on that list, within 33 years, dead or in prison for the rest of their lives. Well, they said that you were the biggest money earner in the mafia since Al Capone. Well, again, I, I don't have the, the stats, but um, I don't think there was anybody earning more money than I was at that time, 
like I said, there'll never be another scheme like I was part of creating in the gas business at that time. I mean, it was it was unbelievable money. And, um, you know, since the days of Prohibition, I was told that that was the most money that, uh, that any one guy was bringing into that life. Okay. So here you are making hundreds of millions of dollars, living a lavish lifestyle, and your father is already on the radar of law enforcement. So you get on the, the radar of law enforcement as well. So at what point did you realize, okay, things are starting to close in on me in terms of law? Well, you know, my first, uh, after I had three state indictments, I had a number of arrests. They were arresting me a lot, but I had three state indictments. I went to trial. I beat all those cases. All grand larceny and extortion and all that kind of stuff. Beat them all. And then uh, Giuliani indicted me on a big racketeering case. And I was one of the first major mob guys he indicted under the RICO statute. I was a lead defendant, me and this other fellow who's now dead. And um, I knew that was serious. I knew that it, uh, they convict me on that. I'm going away for a long time. Okay. And RICO, even though it was already on the books, it wasn't really used until your time. Correct. It was on the books, from what I understand, uh, since 1970. Mm -hmm. But it was never really used properly, and Giuliani came from Washington, became the U.S. Attorney, Southern District of, of New York, Manhattan, and he was the one that started to use the RICO law effectively against us. And I was one of the first big indictments. And um, I was on trial for several months, and I beat that case. If I don't beat that case, I probably wouldn't be sitting here now because uh, he would have given me 50 or 100 years. Okay. How much money were you spending on lawyers during this time? I spent millions. Millions, millions on lawyers? Yes. Millions. Okay. So you're spending millions of dollars. Well, you're making tens of millions, but you're spending yes. millions yes. as well to keep you out of prison. Yes. So you're getting these indictments, and you're actually going to trial and beating these trials? Yeah. yeah okay. I went to trial three times in the state, actually four times in the state, and then this big federal trial in, in the Southern District of New York in Manhattan in a courtroom. So I, I was tied up for several months on that case, and then, of course, you're preparing for a year before you go to trial. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big strain on you, but, you know, fortunately I beat the case. At the end, the result worked out okay. Okay, so, so you actually won through a jury verdict? Yes, I was acquitted. Aha. So the jury unanimously said that not guilty. Not guilty. Okay. And in a criminal case, which is different than a civil case, it's, you know, much harder to convict somebody. It has, you know, um, what's, the, what's the phrase they use? Uh, beyond reasonable doubt. Well, I don't think it's too hard to convict somebody because the conviction rate is pretty high, you know, and, and especially with the feds. Well, the feds is like a 95% conviction. Yes. State's definitely lower. State's lower, yes. Okay. You'd rather be indicted by the state than the feds right. any time, that's for sure. Uh, but Giuliani is basically out to get you at this point. Yes. He told you he wants to give you 100 years. Yes. Told me he was going to give me double what my father got. Okay, which years. was 50. Yeah. Were... Are there any rumors of jury tampering or anything of that sort during any of your cases? No, never heard that. Never heard that? No. Okay. Well, regardless, you won. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, we, uh, I, I have 15 co-defendants, and the jury was out seven or eight days. Mm. We polled the jury afterwards, and the jury told us, the jury foreman said that they acquitted me in the first hour of the first day. And that's how, that was a bad case. I mean, they should never indicted me on it, but they gave me all the headaches and went for all that money. But uh, it was, they shouldn't have indicted me. Then ultimately you did get indicted. Yes. Well, got you got convicted. Again. I took a plea. You took a plea. Yes. About uh, 1980, was it 85? Yeah, I think 85 or early 86. I got indicted in the Eastern District for another big racketeering case. Okay. And... Uh, the underlying acts was really tax fraud and fraud and all that stuff. This was the gasoline stuff. It had to do with gasoline and some other things, yeah. Fraudulent loans, they said that I did, and construction stuff, a whole bunch okay. of stuff. Well, you got indicted on 14 counts of racketeering. Yeah. And uh, counterfeiting, uh, extortion, gasoline bootleg. All that so stuff, forth. yeah. Um, counterfeiting? I don't even remember what that, you know, it was one of the counts. I don't remember what we counted. I think what happened is, 
if I remember, I had a guy around me that was counterfeiting money. Okay. And he was one of my guys, and we went along with it at the time. You know, he had this process where he, I don't know, four colors, <laughs> whatever the heck he was doing. So <laughs> they indicted him. He was with me, so I get indicted. Okay. So in 86, you, uh, you pled guilty to two counts. Correct. Took a plea deal. Yes. You were sentenced to how long? Ten years. Ten years. But you ended up serving three and a half. No, I actually served eight on the ten. Oh, you served eight? Yeah. Okay. I got out. Yeah, I don't know where they came up with that number. I did, uh, I did five straight, and then I was out on parole for about 13 months. And then I violated parole and went back for another 35 months. Okay, yeah, the 35 months. Okay, that, that's what I got confused yeah. with. So got a it. total of eight. Okay, so you did five years. Right. Okay. Was this the first time you were in prison? In prison, yes. Okay. I mean, I've been locked up in jail, but prison, yes. Okay, so before you get locked up, you make bail, you get out. Correct. But now you're actually doing hard time. Correct. So you go into prison as a made man. Yes. Did that matter in these prisons? Well, yeah, I mean, it carries a certain amount of weight, especially the fact that I was so high profile and that, you know, it was a large money crime and, you know, all that. So it, it has to do with, uh, you know, you, you kind of raise your profile there and maybe the inmates look up to you and all that kind of stuff. You know, it doesn't help you that much with the, the prison, you know, the guards and the warden and all that stuff, but the inmates, yeah. I mean, when you watch Goodfellas and you see, like, how they're locked up and they're cooking Italian food and they got... You know, they're all hanging out and they're each other's cells and so forth. Was it like that or not really? Absolute nonsense. <laughs> no. I mean, that was so good. We all laughed when we saw that. I mean, look, I don't know if that happened in the state 50 years ago. It certainly never happened in the feds. And uh, it's, it's not any, anywhere near that. That was just a, a fantasy. Okay, so you, you do your time. You get out. Right. And I guess you violate your probation. I violated of, parole. Parole because yeah. of tax fraud? It was fraud again, yeah, tax fraud and some other stuff that they accused okay. me of. Yeah. So you get out and you continue to do crime? Sort of? You know, I think the violation was a cheap shot at me. You know, bottom line is they wanted me to cooperate. Okay. And they brought me in to testify. Uh, they subpoenaed me to testify against a partner of mine. I was a boss of the Jersey crew. His name was John Riggy. They brought me into Newark while I was on parole. And the bottom line is I refused to take the witness stand. And very shortly after that, I was violated. Okay. So in the process of, you know, they're trying to give you 100 years. Yeah. So as a made man, and they know you're a made man. Yeah. They're obviously trying to get you to bring down the bosses and Correct. the whole operation. Did you cooperate at all or not at all? Here's what I tried to do. I, I realized that the life was in trouble. Everybody I knew was going away forever. I mean, and I was the youngest guy out of everybody. Guys were getting convicted, coming back 100 years, 300 years, little Vicarina, 300 years. The commission guys, 100 years. My boss, 139 years. Everybody's going away forever. So I said, look, I'm the youngest guy out of everybody. They're gonna give me 500 years. So I tried to, okay, I gotta do some maneuvering here. I tried to make the government think that I was going to clean up my life because I really intended to. I mean, I wasn't going back to that life. I had made a decision. If I want to preserve my life and my family, I had a young wife, I had little kids, I have to make a move here because I'm going to go away forever. So I tried to make the government feel that I was going along, you know, and they talked to me. I'd tell them things, but I would never implicate anybody in a crime. So I was basically giving them background information, you know, uh, well, what is the mob really like? Well, let me tell you but I wouldn't implicate anybody. And so when they wanted me to testify, I wouldn't do it. You know, they brought me in on one trial. I had to, I was subpoenaed to go into it. And I really, the guy didn't, didn't, never went to jail. But he wasn't a member of that life. He was an associate and he was my associate. Okay, and he never went, did one day in prison. So that was fine. We had it kind of arranged that way. But when they, they tried to really force me into testifying against my former associates, made guys, I wouldn't do it. And they were upset about it. So uh, I tried to play a game, make them think I'm going to be a good guy now, leave me alone, let me live my life. But, you know, the gig was up at some point in time, and that's when I believe they violated me and put me back in. That was it.
you know, as made men, you guys take an oath of silence. Yes. But how often were made men actually testifying against each other and breaking that code? And You know, when the racketeering law came out and um, guys started to see that this isn't a game anymore, you're getting 20, 30, 40, 50 years, the game changed. And performance were popping up everywhere. Guys were flipping. I mean, Sammy the Bull, you name it, they're flipping. And um, I'll never forget, after I took my plea, and I was in custody, I take my plea, uh, well, actually, I had to go down to Florida. I had a big racketeering case in Florida, the whole gas thing. So they transported me to Florida to take my plea down there first, and then coming back to Brooklyn to take my plea in the federal case. I was surrounded by 15 agents on a plane, I'll never forget. And now that I had taken the plea and it was over, the agents were curious. They were saying, Mike, you know what, when we were investigating you this time, you know, what happened? Is this what really happened? So I would tell them. And finally I said, you know what, I'm taking a plea. I said, I'm tired of beating you guys. I said, I'll give you a win. That's it. You know, and I was teasing them. And I said, look, if I went to trial on this case, I'd probably beat you again. I said, but, you know, I'm throwing in a towel. And one guy looked at me, I'll never forget. He was the postal inspector. And he looked at me and he said to me, you wouldn't have beat us this time. You became a superstar. Your guys were lining up to testify against you. Mm. And it sunk in. I never forgot that. And you know what? He was right. Okay, my partner became an informant. Guys that I knew that were fairly close to me, informants. So that's what happened to the life. Made men. Uh, one of them was a made guy. Um, the others were all my associates. So at 87, you're in prison. Yes. And you decide to leave the Colombo family. Yes. Now, this is not actually allowed. No. When you join, when you take your blood oath, you're in it for life. For life, yes. But you decided to break that. Yes. Did you inform anybody when you did that? No, I mean, I, I, uh, the way it happened, Life Magazine had written a big story about me, and um, I had done an interview with them only because they contacted the warden. I was in prison, the reporter did, and the warden said that the, uh, the reporter said, if you cooperate with the story, it'll be a better story on you. And again, I'm trying to keep things calm. I don't want any more indictments. And so I do a, an interview with the guy in prison, and I tell him, look, there is no mob. I married this California girl. I'm, you know, doing my time. I'm going to get out and live my life. Well, a couple of weeks later, the story comes out, and the warden asked me back into the warden's office. He looks at me, he says, Francis, do you have a death wish? I said, what are you talking about? And he shows me the article. It's a bad article. I mean, big picture of me, double page, and on the top, quitting the mafia. Mm. And I'm in jail with a bunch of mob guys, you know, and he says, I got to lock you down. This guy had me doing everything but testifying against everybody. It wasn't true. So that kind of set a wave going on the street. The feds come in a little bit later, hey, you're a dead man anyway. Words all over the street, you know, cooperate with us, we'll put you in a program. So I'm not going in a program, I don't want to cooperate in that regard. So I mean, that's kind of started this whole wave of things. So I didn't have to tell anybody, it kind of happened that way. But I did send word to, back to my father, my father was in jail. And I said, Dad, don't believe what you hear, I'm not going to hurt anybody. I don't know if they believe me or not, honestly. Okay, so you got locked down after that. They put but me in lockdown. Did they yeah. put you in PC at that point? They put me in administrative detention. Okay. In other words, for my own protection, they said. Okay. But then you get out. Yes. Did they offer you witness protection? Oh, yeah. Okay. So they That's offered to change your identity, move your family to Idaho, yes. Yes. that type of thing. Yes. And I refused it. Why is that? Because I wasn't going to hurt anybody. And, you know, I was leaving life for what I felt were the right reasons. You know, protect my family. You, you got to understand, my family... My mother, brother, sisters are devastated as a result of my father being in prison and his involvement in that life. I had a young wife. I didn't want to start my relationship with her by destroying our family. So I wanted out of the life. I wasn't going to, I didn't want it by hurting anybody. I wasn't mad at anybody. I didn't want revenge on anybody. Mm -hmm. I just wanted out of the life. Okay, but there were hits put out on you at that point. Yes. Okay, by who? My former boss, uh, Carmine Persico. Okay, who's he now? He passed away now passed on March 7th. Uh, yeah, he, was, he took it very personal when I walked away. Did you ever speak to him after that? No, no, he was in prison also. Okay, so you get out, you walk away, and the whole world knows that you're quitting the mafia because of this yes. article. You moved to California? Yes. 
Okay. And now you're actually having to watch your back. Correct. And move a lot different. Yes. How paranoid were you during that, that era? You know, I wouldn't call it paranoia. I would call it, I was very careful. You know, I'll tell you what happened here. You know, one of the horrors about, of that life, you make a mistake, your best friend walks you into a room, you don't walk out again. And I had, obviously I knew of those experiences. I was a captain and I had an experience similar to that at one point in time where they were trying to, boss was trying to, you know, I think he was trying to shake me up because he heard I was making billions of dollars. There were stories out there and I was only turning in millions. So, you know, uh, there was a story written that I was becoming strong enough to break away from the Colombo, start my whole family, my own family, because I had the Russians with me. I had a lot of guys on the street. There was no truth to it at all, but it gets into guys' heads. So he tried to shake me up a little bit. Well, I'll be honest with you. I walked into a room and I didn't think I was going to walk out. I really didn't. I, so I you get a you get a call for a sit down. Yeah. And you know that there's some sort of tense situation around it. Yes. So you're walking into a room knowing that you might be murdered in that room. Yes. And you can't bring your guys with you. You can't no. bring bodyguards. You got to walk in solo. Yeah. Okay. What if you say I'm not going this, to this meeting? You're in trouble. You're in trouble. Can't say I'm not going. Uh, if you do, you just about you, you put your own hit out on you. You know. Okay. But you know, people have said to me, you know, how did you walk into that room? You know, it's was it heroic? And I said, no, it wasn't heroic. It was more robotic. I was such a product of that life that I said, hey, if this is it, I guess this is it. You know, I was scared. I'm not going to lie to you. You think you're meeting your maker. It's, it's, it's not pleasant, but, um, you know, I'm here, actually. So it worked out. But since I had that experience, I said, nobody's going to walk me into a room. They're going to have to work to get me. So I move out to California. I don't put a house in my name, no utilities. I don't walk my dog at the same time every morning. I don't go to the same restaurant every week. I stayed out of clubs. I was very disciplined because I knew I couldn't create patterns in my life and I couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't, I had to be careful who I had around me. But I wasn't paranoid, well, disciplined. Your, your own father, I guess, spoke against you in one of these meetings or something like that? Well, he went along with it from what I was told. He went along with the contract on my life. And, you know... Oh, wait, wait. So, so... Everyone knows when, when it was announced that you're leaving the mafia, the head of the Colombo family puts out a hit on you, and your dad goes along with it. Yes, that's what I was told. And I understood the position my dad was in, because if I were to become a major witness against guys, it would be bad for him because he proposed me into that life. It wouldn't look good for him. So would he be killed? He, my dad in had a lot situation? of respect at the time. I don't know that he'd been, I don't know. You know, you never know in this life. Right. But I went way out of my way to make sure that that didn't happen. I would never put my dad in jeopardy. As a matter of fact, I kept telling him, don't believe whatever you hear. I am not going to be testifying against any of the guys. Don't believe it. Right, because in the Donnie Brasco story, was it Lefty who brought him in? Yes. Ended up getting killed. Lefty for, didn't for know. Oh, that he didn't get killed? True. No, Lefty. Oh, in the movie he got killed. That was a killed. fallacy in the movie. Okay, Lefty actually died of cancer, I believe. Okay. Sonny Red and Sonny Black got killed. For co-signing. Sonny, yes. For Sonny co -signing Black was really Donnie the guy Brasco. that got killed. Yeah. So if you co-sign a made man, that made man turns into a rat. Could, it could be a problem for you, could yes. Could be a problem. Okay. Would it have gone to that extent with my dad? I, I don't know, because he was a well-respected guy, but it could have. So you find out your dad co-signed a hit on you. Was there any actual attempts? Um, I had two times when the FBI came to me and said, there are people here we have learned from our informants. Uh, if you don't leave town, you're going to be dead by the weekend. Okay. And we had to pack up and move because I took it serious. You moved out of your home. Yeah, we left for a couple of days. And uh, I'll never forget, it was a holiday weekend. And what happened is they had told my wife that. I had come home. I was on parole. And they were in the, uh, in the den with her, and she was crying. And I said, what are you, you know, I got mad. It's why you tell my wife this, because you may not take this seriously. It's serious. So I had to pack up with our kids, and we left for a couple of days, yeah. Okay. But nothing ultimately happened? Uh, we, I had two kind of close incidents, I think, but... Uh, two close? Well, when I think there were guys that I, that I knew about that I had to avoid. I knew guys were in town. Okay. And I knew uh, what their purpose was. I mean, were you carrying a gun during this point and ready to, to shoot out if necessary? You know, if I had to protect myself, I would have. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Well, you have a younger brother. Yes. Who I guess was a drug addict. Yes. 
and he ended up actually testifying against your father. Yes. So your father went back to prison at the age of 97. Yeah, well, he was 90, yeah, 96, 97, yeah. What did your brother say exactly? Well, he had, uh, he got himself in some trouble and uh, he agreed to cooperate and uh, became an informant and he wired himself up and, you know, he got my father on tape and he ended up uh, testifying against him in trial. Was, was your brother a made man? No. So he was just, was he an associate? Well, you'd have to call him an associate because he was my brother and my father's <laughs> okay, son. And, right. uh, but, you know, he, was, uh, he had, a, he had a, a drug problem that just screwed him up his whole life. What kind know? of drugs? Uh, he was on the hard stuff. I mean, heroin. Cocaine, and, uh, heroin. Yeah, yeah. Co uh, not heroin, cocaine. I mean, I don't know if he did. I don't know every combination of drugs he did, I'll be honest with right. you. Right. So your own brother took the stand against your father. Was he facing a bunch of years himself? I don't think so. I, I, you know, I, I don't know what really happened as to why he made the decision to cooperate. I knew the government had contacted him. And whether he had something pending, hanging over his head, or he did not, for some reason, I tell you what I believe. This is my case. My brother had contracted the HIV virus. The medication was very uh, expensive. And I, I kind of think that he did this maybe for his health, that if he went into the program, the government would take care of his physical problems, mm. and they did. And, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I think... I mean, I can't say that affirmatively, but I believe that's, that's part of the reason. But my brother had a lot of street trouble. I mean, he's always getting himself in trouble because of his drug problem. Okay. Is he still alive? He is. He's still alive. Okay. And he straightened, him, he straightened himself out. Uh, how many years did your dad get? He got uh, eight years at that point. At 97? Yes. He got eight years? Yes. My God. The government wanted 15. <laughs> the, uh, the judge cut it in half. Okay. Did you ever talk to your brother after that? I did. How was that conversation? You know, look, uh, I love my brother. You know, I don't, I don't like what he did, um, but I understand when drugs take a hold of you, it's, it's a tough situation. I, unfortunately, my sister died of an overdose of drugs, and, you know, I saw my brother throughout his life with drugs, so we've had a lot of bad experiences. So I understood, you know, what it did to him. I love my brother. I felt horrible about what he did. Uh, my father was destroyed over it. He couldn't believe it. Um, and I spoke to him. He had, you know, like a pang of consciousness about it at the time. And, and I think he was sincerely regretted what he did. You know, and he's tried to make up for it. I mean, you know, what could I say? I mean, look, fortunately, he, he, the target was my dad and not other people on the street. So it was, for me, it was really a family matter. Forget the family. It was our family matter. Mm. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, I hear he's straightened himself out and that he's, he's doing okay. He's actually working with uh, people that had that problem before him and he's trying to straighten it out. He's kicked the drug problem. So, I mean, I, I wish him well. I hope I get to, you know, one day that we, we get to see him again. Okay. Did your father forgive your brother? You know, um, I don't think uh, publicly he will because my dad is... You know, he lives by the code. I have to say that about him. But my dad loves his children. And I think he knew my brother had these severe issues. And I think as a father uh, that he would forgive my brother, again, because my brother did it with him. And look, we had a tough childhood. I mean, you know, we, we didn't live like normal people. We had a rough life. And uh, it wears on the family. I, I got to tell you this. So You talked about the JFK murder uh, before. Um, looking, I'm trying to think of the timeline. That this was before you joined yourself. Yeah, this was during your dad's era. Correct. Now you believe that the mafia has something to do with JFK's murder. Yeah, I, I, I believe that firmly because of what I was told. And there's no reason for people to mislead or lie to me. People as part of that life that had knowledge. Yeah. And what did you what did you hear exactly? From what I was told, uh, it makes sense to me that, you know, um, there was a deal struck with the White House through Joe Kennedy, and um, it was violated, and people on the street were very upset about it. Okay, Joe Kennedy was, uh, was the father. Yeah. Who was in the bootlegging business, the Correct. liquor bootlegging business. Correct. So he was already dealing with the mafia already. Yeah, and at one point in time, 
um, they wanted to kill Joe Kennedy because he was either double dealing or not doing right on the street. And I think it was Frank Costello that saved him or agreed not to kill him or whatever. Um, so that's how entrenched he was. I mean, he knew guys on the street, 100%. He was the connection there. And um, there was a deal struck, and they didn't live up to it. And Bobby Kennedy went even further. I mean, he started prosecuting them off. People right. were very upset. Okay, and you think because of that, they actually put together a hit on John F. Kennedy yeah. using... Um, what was the name of the guy that, that killed him? Uh, Oswald? Yeah. And then, Lee, and then Lee Harvey Ruby. Oswald. Yeah. Okay, so you think the Italian Mafia worked with Lee Harvey Oswald to kill Kennedy? Yeah, now I don't, I don't know if they directly worked with, uh, with Oswald. I mean, Jack Ruby, you know, was, was certainly associated with okay, us. Okay, right, because Jack Ruby was one that killed Oswald after killed he Oswald. was apprehended. He walked up to him and killed him right, right. there in front As of Right, as he was going to a court appearance. He was in custody, Oswald. Right, and uh, I remember reading about this, and I guess his reason was that, I guess he was a Jewish guy, and he wanted to show the world that Jews were tough, which is kind of a strange yeah. <laughs> reason. I mean, look, the government will never, I mean, all these documents that are under seal that would never been released, the government is never going to want to admit to the fact that the mob had a hit on the President of the United States and was able to carry it out because that just doesn't look good for them. Okay, and Jack Ruby was a mob guy? He was associated, yeah. Associated, yeah, absolutely. Okay. But he, since he wasn't Italian, he wasn't actually yeah. a made man or anything. And you have no, to be Italian. he wasn't a made guy. He wasn't you a had, made guy. Were there ever non-Italians that were made men? No, no not such to thing. my knowledge, no. You had to be, a t your father had to be Italian. Got it. Well, you know, I guess around that time, there was also the J. Edgar Hoover thing. And I remember J. Edgar Hoover publicly said there's no such thing as the mafia. Right. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, the reason for that is uh, Hoover used to go into, uh, well, one of the reasons, I want to say it's the, de the definite reason, but he used to frequent some places in Manhattan that were mob controlled. One of them was the Stork Club. And um, I was told upon good information that he was there with his boyfriend at the time. And the Stork Club at the time was bugged and wired because the owner of the store club, a lot of celebrities would come in there, he would wire and bug these people and actually extort them or have information on them to either keep them coming to the club or whatever else he was doing. So he happened to catch uh, Hoover and his boyfriend on tape in the bathroom doing some stuff that they shouldn't have. And they held it over Hoover's head. And that was one incident that caused Hoover to never admit that there was a mafia. Right, I guess Hoover was also a cross-dresser. Yeah. And I heard there was photos and, and so forth. They had forth. photos and everything else. They knew for sure. He would never admit to the existence of the mob. Because at that point, if you were exposed as a homosexual, it was the end of that was life, life as you know it. Correct. These days, it's a little bit different. Correct. You know, the, the CEO of Apple is yeah. gay and out of the closet and no one even bats it. It out. was unacceptable back then. It's acceptable today. Right. And he ended up, because of not prosecuting not going after the Mafia, he ended up going after the Black Panthers as, you know, public enemy number one. Correct. So it's kind of a weird, you know, uh, yeah. uh, the effect was, was kind of messed up, I think. And what happened was, uh, could have been left at that and everything would have been great. But Bobby Kennedy, on the other hand, picked up the mantle and he started going after the mob. Right. And JFK. that wasn't supposed to happen. Right. And JFK gets killed ultimately. Right. Your father was around during the whole Jimmy Hoffa time. Yeah. Did he ever deal with Jimmy Hoffa? Uh, I don't know if he dealt personally with Jimmy Hoffa, no. Okay. But I guess you had said in a previous interview that you have some idea where Jimmy Hoffa no. is buried or where his body was dumped off. Yes. I guess in the ocean? I can tell you that it's wet. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I have, uh, look, I, I know where it came down from. I mean, look, uh, the order came from New York, even though he had, uh, you know, he was hooked up, Hoffa was with the, uh, patriarchal family out of New England, but uh, the order came down from New York. And um, upon good information again, um, I think I, I know who the real shooter was. Still alive in yep. prison. Yeah. yeah. And I actually have some tapes um, with somebody that was with that person for quite a long time. And um, they reveal certain things on those tapes. Okay, those tapes have never been released? No. 
So from everything you know, Jimmy Hoffa was killed by the mafia. Oh, 100%. 100%. 100%. Because, you know, that's what people assume, but it was never actually proven or disproven. 100%. Okay. Because he had the mob ties when yes. doing all the union activities. He was supposed to come home and just, you know, go off into the sunset, and he refused. He wanted the position back and couldn't have it. Well, at one point, uh, you actually, I mean, you left the mafia, but you never renounced the mafia until later on. Yes. When you became a Christian. Correct. Okay. And I guess you realized that being in the mafia, you know, you had to treat the boss as a god, and you realized that Jesus Christ was someone that you wanted to follow instead. Well, I never thought of it that way. You know, look, I always say this about my former life. Did I enjoy it when I was in there? Yeah. Did I want to be the best possible mob guy I could be? Yes. Was I committed? Yes, 100%. But stepping away, I have to be honest, it's an evil lifestyle. And the reason I say it's evil, I'm not calling the guys evil because I was one of them. I just happen to be very fortunate, blessed actually. But I don't know any family of any member of that life that hasn't been totally devastated, including my own, not my wife and kids, but mother, father, sister, brothers. So any lifestyle that does that to a family and to people is evil. So I renounce it in that regard. You know, I, um, were there some good qualities about that life? Yeah. I mean, a life that is allegedly built on honor and respect and loyalty, do I find that admirable? I, I honestly do. The problem is, like anything else, like in our government today, that principle gets corrupted. You know, I saw guys die for reasons they shouldn't have died for. There's greed, there's power struggles. It's like anything else. But the principle of that life, I agreed with. I, I actually did. We're loyal to one another. We don't betray one another. We never, be, you know, we never uh, violate another man's wife, mother, sister, daughter. You know, we're honest with each other. We don't call each other names. When we have a sit down or we have a dispute, we can't call you each other liars. We have to be respectful. So there's a lot of good principle in that life. The problem is it gets corrupted. You know, and um, you know, I, I still look at it the same way. You know, and, and look, I know the government comes down on it, but you know, the government does a lot of things that are, that are not too good also, because power corrupts. Mm -hmm. I think we see that in our everyday life. So again, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not glorifying the life in any way. I'm just giving you my honest opinion of it. You know, you were in an organization that was murdering people. I'm not saying that you had anything to do with any of these murders. Right. You know, there's no statute of limitations to that, so we're not going to talk about that. But you were part of a crew of people that was killing people's husbands, fathers, brothers, friends, you know, was, Colum was the Colombo family into drugs at all or no? We were not into drugs. Not into we, drugs. we were told if we got involved with drugs, we got killed. Okay. So you were doing drugs, but extortion, that type of thing. Do you ever look back on that and feel bad over some of the things you were involved in and feel like you have to atone to those, you know, for those things? You know, I have regrets for things that I've done in that life, but I want you to understand that everybody talks about murder all the time. It's the most serious thing, and it is that people attribute to the, to the evil of that life. But here, here's the way we looked at it, whether right or wrong. When we come into that life, we take an oath. And at that time, we're told if we violate the oath, we could pay for it with our lives. And your best friend might be called upon because the life becomes before anything. Now, we weren't random killers. Murder was taken extremely seriously. It could only be ordered by the boss. There was always discussion about it. And, uh, you know, we weren't doing drive-by shootings. We weren't just randomly killing people. You know, it was confined to us. And when I say us, it was we that knew that we could pay the price if we made a mistake or we did something wrong. Now, what I said before is that I saw people die for, I don't think they should have, because the life gets corrupted. But I, I always want to say this. We weren't random killers. We didn't go around murdering people. It was taken very seriously. And I think that's a wrap. You know, you see all of these wars. Well, who are we killing? We're killing each other. <laughs> you know, we're not going out on the street and killing people. Now, you know, once in a while I've heard, you know, an innocent person got killed. Okay, 100% wrong. Should never happen. None of this should happen, but it does. But I, I always try to make it clear. We killed each other. And we knew what we were getting into. 
when I walked away, I knew I could pay for this with my life because that's the oath that I took. So we understand that. I mean, back then when you were doing it, they did not have the kind of surveillance they have these days. You know, you, 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 know, you had clunky, you know, if you had a recording device. It was a Nagra. It was a, yeah, yeah it you, was could, you could feel it exactly. <laughs> on some, under somebody's shirt. There weren't cameras on every signpost. There were right. no satellites. Correct. There, there were no cell phones that you could triangulate. That's right. These days, being a criminal seems a lot harder. Absolutely. Saying that, does the mafia still exist in 2019? The mob still exists, and I don't believe it'll go away in my lifetime. Um, these guys are very resourceful. It's not anywhere near what it was at one point in time because I have to say the government in the 80s did a good job. They took the union power away for the most part. Um, you know, they took a lot of contacts that we had, uh, power uh, bases that we had, they took it away. Racketeering Act, uh, Bail Reform Act, you know, uh, you know, all of this stuff, Sentencing Reform Act. I mean, it really, really made a dent in that lifestyle, but it's not going away. Okay. Certainly not in New York, Chicago, places where it's a stronghold. We said out of all the movies out there, Goodfellas and Donnie Brasco, those are the most authentic mafia movies. I would say Goodfellas, yeah, fairly accurate. I knew all those guys. Okay. Um, it was depicted well. Donnie Brasco, like I say, they took the dramatic liberty there, but it was, it was pretty accurate. Casino is actually my favorite movie out of yeah, the Yeah, I genre. like Casino. Casino was but, good. But not, not accurate. Not really. Not really. <laughs> and you said Sopranos is completely inaccurate. If a mob boss was ever visiting a psychiatrist, he'd be in the trunk of his car by the end of the week, okay. along with the psychiatrist. I'll tell you what I think the best, <laughs> I'll tell you what I think the best mob movie, one of the best, it's, it, it's not as notable because it, it wasn't a, uh, a theatrical release, but the HBO movie, Gotti, where Armand DeSanti played Gotti, hmm. I thought that was brilliantly done. Extremely, it was about as accurate a movie as you're gonna see on that life, certainly on that story. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if you haven't, go on HBO, go and watch it. It was great. Great movie. Our son, our son, everybody was, was terrific in that movie. Well, there was actually a movie about your life. Uh, a documentary. Documentary. Yeah. Right. Uh, we're in talks now to make a movie. I've always been kind of resistant of it, but maybe the timing is right now. Okay. And you've done a bunch of books as well. Yes. You know, as the only high-ranking member of one of the five families who's out there talking about it, writing books about it, doing documentaries about it. Any sort of backlash from any of your former associates or, or people who are currently, I mean, does the Colombo family still exist, number one? It does, yes. It does? Yes. So how does the Colombo family feel about you right now? You know, bottom line is I never put anybody in prison. And they knew that that's not what I was about. Did they like the fact that I walked away? No. Did they like the fact that I'm talking about it? No. Do people say, oh, he's a rat, he's this, he's that? You get that section of people that do that. You know, half the people that talk about rats, they don't even know what a rat is or really what, what it's all about. They just try to talk and act tough. Um, but there are a lot of people that support what I've done. I've never had a run in with anybody. Nobody's ever approached me directly and said, hey, this and that. Yeah, sometimes online people will make a remark. I, that doesn't bother me. Okay. Um, again, bottom line is I never hurt anybody. And that was very significant to everybody. Okay. Are you familiar with the Takashi 69 case that's going on right now? Not really, no. It's a rapper out of New York with rainbow hair. I, I know who he is, but I don't know the case. Right. Yeah. Well, he, he got arrested, I guess, him and his whole crew got arrested under the RICO. Hmm. And uh, he had nine, nine charges mm -hmm. against him. And he is currently, you know, we actually had his guilty plea paperwork where he is agreeing to cooperate hmm. with all law enforcement's against all of his co-defendants. Wow. Some of these co-defendants were actually, you know, like some of the interesting things about this case is there was a video of him essentially putting a hit out on somebody, hmm. telling a guy, I'll, I'll give you 20 or 30,000 to go handle that. And then that guy get, as, ends up getting shot at shortly afterwards. He's, he ended up testifying against that guy as well. Wow. And the government, you know, based on the paperwork is that if he completely cooperates, they're not going to prosecute on all nine charges. Do you see this type of thing happen? Absolutely. I mean, look, I, you know, I got to be honest with you. Let's take Gotti's case and let's take Sammy the Bull. Yeah. Sammy admitted 
to 19 murders. He admitted to 19 murders. Right. In my view, how do you give a guy that is basically a serial murderer by his own admission, how do you give him a pass? Right. Because he testified against John Gotti, who had a bigger name, who they wanted to get, who beat them a couple of times. But look, John, John Gotti, in my opinion, on his worst day, was a, as good or better a guy than Sammy the Bull. Sammy just wasn't as flamboyant. He didn't thumb his nose in the government's face. So how does a, a civilized government make a deal with a guy like that and put him back on the street? And what happens when he comes out? Goes into an ecstasy ring and starts selling right, yeah. ecstasy. Right, yeah. He got, he got caught with a drug ring, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how do you justify that? And I got, I'm, I'm not, nothing personal against Sammy at all. Did you know Sammy? Yeah. Nothing personal, but how does the government, take Sammy or anybody else, how does the government make a deal with somebody like that and put him back out on the street? Go get him, fight the case, do whatever, but to make the kind of deals that they're making, you know, I mean, it doesn't work for me. I'm sorry. Right. So Sammy, ultimately, I, I just looked it up, in 2002, he's convicted of the drug ring mm -hmm. and given uh, 15, years, to, right? 15 to 17 yeah. years. He was released. In he just got out about a year. Just got out in 2017. So yeah. he's still out there. He's 74 years old. Yeah. Did it surprise you when he uh, turned on everybody like that? You know, yes and no, because guys were starting to flip left and right. And I said, well, there's just another one going down. It's like I said, you know, nobody wants to do 100 years in prison. Yeah. I don't care who they are. <clears throat> Unless you're Sonny Francis, my dad, who will do 1,000 years before he would cooperate. And he's the only guy I know that I can say without any shadow of a doubt that my dad would never, ever, ever cooperate. Well, I mean, that's basically what happened you know, with the Takashi situation is that they wanted the other guys who were more hardened criminals. This guy was kind of young. I think he was like 20 years old or 19 years old. The other guys actually had long criminal records and mm -hmm. were like the quote unquote real gangsters of mm -hmm. that crew. So they're using him to put everybody away. But it's a very strange situation because a lot of them were doing crimes on this guy's behalf to work out his various rap beefs and, and so forth. And then I, I got to tell you, I speak to a lot of young people. You know, it's part of the ministry that I have. And I, I speak to gangbangers all the time. I go into detention centers and I tell them straight out, let me give you some good advice if you want to be a criminal, you want to stay on the street. You're going to do something, do it alone. That's it. That's it. I mean, nobody can snitch on you later on. I said, because your best friend, you know, that's going to go to war with you during your criminal activity, watch what happens when they get him in the room alone. They say, hey, you know what, you either can go away the rest of your life for the next 40, 50 years, because you don't get parole anymore. You're doing 85%. Hmm. You get 50, you're doing 40 and change. Okay, either that or talk to us. We'll help you out. We'll give you a new identity. That guy's going away forever anyway. Don't worry about it. And at least you'll preserve your life. See how friendly he is with you at that point. Right. Well, I interviewed Freeway Ricky Ross, who mm -hmm. was one of the biggest drug dealers right. on the West Coast. His plug, you know, his drug connect, ended up being an informant and took the stand and helped him to get a life sentence. Mm -hmm. And when I asked him what would happen if, if this guy walked in, Louis Blandon, I think was the guy's name, he said, absolutely nothing. What would happen if he walked in the room right now? Oh, nothing. Nothing. I have absolutely nothing against him. Really? No. Nah. Wasn't his fault. See, the way I look at it is, first of all, I made the mistake of getting in the drug business. That was my first mistake. Mm -hmm. My next mistake was I went back into the drug business as I said I quit. Yeah. So what he did is he only did what people do in the drug business. They tell. They set you up. Hmm. And for somebody to go into the drug business and not understand that, which I was in the drug business and didn't understand it, mm -hmm. um, but I came to grips with it. Is that really the reality of a life of crime from your point of view that telling and snitching is just part of it? So if you're going to get into it, just realize that's what it is? I, I believe so. You know, I, I had a similar circumstances. The fellow that snitched on me was my partner in the gas business. We created the scheme together. He was, uh, he was six foot four, almost 500 pounds, huge guy. We worked together for seven years. We never had a problem between us. We got very close. My kids called him Uncle Larry. His kids called me Uncle Michael. Our wives knew each other. We were close. When he snitched, 
you know, people told me on the street, listen, we'll take care of this for you or you can take care of it, but the guy's got to go. And I said, no, it's okay. I said, I knew at some point in time he might be weak. I understood what, what I was up against. I said, I know his wife and kids. I mean, you know, I'll fight him in court. And so that's how I felt too. And you know, he ended up, he ended up testifying against me. That's the reason I went to jail basically in the case. And what happened with him? Okay, they let him out. He goes back into the gas business in Texas. He gets caught, <laughs> puts his whole family in trouble. He got 20 years. Hmm. They put him back in jail. So things, to, you know, but it's, it's part of the business. You know what's gonna happen. You don't want it to happen. You try to avoid it. You try to be careful, but it's gonna happen. So you get out. You know, and you start writing books and doing speaking engagements and so forth. Um, and that's essentially supporting, that was supporting you? In, in good part, yeah. Yeah, were you getting regular jobs, nine to fives or? No. No, not Never. your thing. I haven't had a regular job since I worked on the World Trade Center in the summer of uh, uh, when I was in high school. I was a union guy, my dad got me a job. Okay. Um, in 2010, you were busted for writing bad checks. Correct. Um, can you talk about that at all? First of all, it was expunged and it was thrown away. I had a, uh, um, uh, an incident, I would say, with my former manager. And uh, I fired him and he got upset and he had two checks that I had given him that I was stopping payment on. And he said that I bounced the checks on him. They locked me on, a, uh, I was getting off a plane in Tennessee because that's where it happened, and they locked me up. Okay. And after we talked about it, uh, I was let loose and they expunged the case and that was the end of it. And that was the only time that you dealt with police since you got since? out? Since? Well, just period, since you got out, out of, yeah, out of prison. Yeah. So you've gone completely legit? Yeah. Was that hard? Listen, you know, um, when, I, when I got out of the life and I came to faith, I didn't get a lobotomy. I don't forget stuff I did on the street. I try to avoid certain things that I know that I might have a tendency to get in trouble with. So I got people around me to keep me accountable. So yeah, in a way, in a way it's tough. You're always in a little bit of a battle, but you know, you gotta surround yourself with the right people. And I fortunately have a very prolific speaking, faith-based career. And so I'm always in the right environment. You know, I'm writing books, they're doing movies on my life, the whole bit. So I mean, I, you know, I have every inclination to stay straight and uh, I don't wanna put my family through any more headaches. Right, but you go from having a private plane, 8,000 square foot house, helicopters, millions of dollars and so forth to, you know, I'm not sure what your lifestyle is now, but I'm pretty sure it's not that. It's not that, but remember in, in the interim, uh, I spent eight years in prison, 29 months and seven days in the hole. I was in solitary for almost three years. Wow. Yeah, they kept me in lockdown. And I gotta tell you, that's not easy. You know, regardless of what anybody says, we weren't meant to be solo, we were meant to be social. And I heard when the lights went out at night, you heard a lot of guys moaning and groaning. It was a tough situation. So, I mean, I know what it is to hit rock bottom because I was there for a long time. And, uh, you know, so when I came out, it was, yeah, I mean, look, I live decently now. I don't have any complaints, but it'll never be to where it was before. So you deal with it, you know. Well, you've actually said that if you had a chance to do it all over again, you would. Well, I've said that. I don't know if I, I believe that now. <laughs> you know, there's certain parts of it that maybe I say, yeah, you know, I'd like to go back for a limited amount of time maybe and, and just have that experience again, but that'll never happen. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing your story. Um, I think it's a very unique story from someone that came from your position because no one else has really been able to tell it from a first-hand perspective before. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, you know, I've been very fortunate and uh, very blessed just to be here, be able to speak to you, so um, appreciate it. Yep, and you have seven children? I have seven children, I have six grandchildren, yeah, so I got a good crew. Your wife is here crew. in the other room My also. My wife, been married 35 years, and. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here. If I don't meet her and, and change my lifestyle, I'd either be dead or in prison, so. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that everyone who's watching this, you know, who, uh, you know, has been involved in crime and, you know, to one degree or another, or has been involved with family who's been involved in crime, like, this is a very rare case of someone that actually gets to ride off into the sunset without doing 100 years, without being murdered, um, you know, without, falling to drugs mm -hmm. at the end or 
committing suicide or something of the sort. So I think it's very much a rarity. But, you know, with this opportunity, you're actually telling the story and, you know, not glamorizing it. I think that's very important. Yeah, well, look, I, I want to be clear in that. I don't glamorize my former life. And I certainly, you know, a big part of what I do now is discouraging these young people from continuing in a life of crime or getting involved in it in the first place. So, because it's a destructive path in life and um, this just makes no sense. Yeah, and I think these days, like I said, with cell phones and cameras everywhere and, and so yeah. forth. Well, look when this guy Cali got killed, you know, the uh, alleged boss of the Genovese family. I mean, within two days, they knew everything because there's cameras all over the streets. Yeah. They had a one thumbprint on a license plate. I mean, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I mean, you, 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 how do you commit a crime today and not get caught? I don't know. Right. And the guy that killed him, it wasn't even mafia related. It was some guy that I guess liked a girl that was hanging out with him and <laughs> Look, that, that's the story. Is there more to it? If there is, we'll find out. But uh, the guy seems a little loony to me, actually, from what I'm reading and from what I heard. So yeah. who knows? Right. Whitey Bulger, he ends up getting killed, yeah. I guess, his first day in general population or something I, of that I don't, sort. I'll be honest with you. I don't know how that happened because I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story. Henry Hill was on separation with me. He was on separation with a lot of guys. He was in the witness protection program, but he was in prison. Well, by mistake, they put him in Terminal Island in, in uh, general population where I was. And we happened to connect in there. Now, there was a, you know, there was a shoot on, uh, I mean, if Henry, anybody of us would have find him, we were supposed to take him out. So by mistake, they put him in the same prison where I was in general population when he was on separation. So the government makes mistakes sometimes. I firmly believe they made a mistake with Whitey. So that was just a... Yeah, it happens. But that was a fatal mistake, obviously. How do you put him in there? The guy is a known snitch. You know, we have people in every prison almost. You know, how the heck do you put him in there? Correct. Right, I guess they cut out his tongue or his eyes or... Yeah, you know. Okay. So when Henry Hill, who was, you know, the character in Goodfellas, you know, the, right. the main guy, he ended up turning against everybody. Yes. And going into um, witness protection yes. later on but you were actually with him in prison at one point. Yeah, and as soon as he saw me, he ran and he PC'd up. He put himself in okay. protective custody were, right were away. Were you supposed to kill him in that situation? Well, the word was out. If we saw Henry and we knew what he did, yeah, we were supposed to take him out. Even though he wasn't part of, he wasn't telling on your family? No, but you know, I mean, I knew Paul Ivario well, I knew Jimmy Burke well, I mean, I knew all Got those it. guys, so that's, you're expected to do something. You know, you can't say, oh, he's here and we're just gonna pal around with him, you know? Okay, so would you have tried to kill him if given the opportunity? Point, no. 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 That wasn't your thing. No, and I, I knew Henry pretty well too, you know, so. No, I mean, when I seen him, I said, oh man, what is he doing here? You know, I went back to my cell. I'll tell you what happened. The lieutenant called me about a, an hour later. I got called into the lieutenant's office and he said to me, Mike, what happened on the yard today? I said, what are you talking about? He's Mike, who did you see on the yard? I said, I didn't see anybody. <laughs> he said, Mike, you got to be honest with me because we're shipping you out of here. Now, if Terminal Island was an hour from my house. I was getting visits. I said, what do you mean you're shipping me out? I said, hey, you know, all right, I saw Henry. I said, ship him out. Don't <laughs> ship me out. He said, well, he already PC'd up. Yeah. Lieutenant liked me, fortunately, so they did ship him out. So Henry Hill's still around? No, he's dead. Oh, he he's died. dead? Yeah. Okay. He lived out here for a long time, but he's dead. Okay. Did he stay in PC or no? I mean, stay in, uh, protective, in, in uh, witness protection or no? Well, when he got out, he kept getting in trouble, so they threw him out of the program, oh, from what it. I understand. Yeah. Henry's a poor soul. He was, he was a uh, Yeah, man, crazy life. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I always say this, in today's society, man, there's so many ways to make legal money. Yes. You know, from Uber to... To a legitimate. You, you know, to, to being a social media influencer to doing whatever man doing music on your own to play starting straight. your own business there's lots of ways to do it that doesn't involve prison time doesn't involve any murders or shootings or stabbings agree you know and honestly that's always the best approach for anyone who's watching i totally this. agree i discourage anybody from life on the street yeah. no doubt well michael man i appreciate you telling your story thank you until next time okay peace